very much, church. Please have a seat. Thank you so much. And thanks for being here this morning. Uh, I love how you said, Pastor Thurston, that you felt so relaxed this morning. And I'm glad you felt that way. I felt the exact opposite uh, coming here. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I feel very comfortable this morning because we are December members at The Boundless. So uh, we spend quite a bit of time here. And it's an honor to be with you this morning to share God's word. And I'm trusting God that what is going to be imparted today and what's going to be shared is going to change and transform your life. And even my life, as I shared, because God is still speaking, God is still teaching. And even as we go through this word this morning, I believe he's going to speak to me and he's going to speak to all of us here. So thank you so much for having us, uh, Pastors Thurston and Natania. It's an honor to be here uh, and a great privilege. And uh, how many of you know that you have gold in this ministry in your pastors? Do you know that? And I'm not saying this because of the very kind words that my friend shared earlier, but honestly... We spend a lot of time with them, and I can tell you today that you have gold in this ministry. You have people who are doing amazing work for God on the front lines as you see them on a platform on a Sunday, but behind the scenes, they are doing amazing things. And so I want to honor you both today, and I want every single person here to be reminded of the fact that you have gold in this ministry. The gifting and the anointing upon their lives is very rare, and I want you to recognize that. Keep that in the back of your mind. Keep it in your heart as you journey with them and as you continue to do the work of God alongside them. So I just want to mention that. Also, the worship team, you guys are amazing. Wow. I was here last week, and uh, I, I, I said to Pastor Thurston afterwards, wow, these guys are on fire. And also, the context behind my statement is that I myself, together with my wife, we are in, in a worship team as well, and I've done so for many years. And I can definitely see there is such a significance upon what you are doing. And so my encouragement is just to keep going, because you guys are doing an amazing work. So can we pray before we, before we get started? Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you this morning for your precious word. Your word is truth and your word is life. Thank you this morning as we sit together as a family around your word that you will impart and speak to us, God. Speak to our hearts. Speak that which you want to speak. Holy Spirit, this is your service. We hand it over to you. We give it to you right now. And so we thank you that, God, you are in control of what we are about to meditate on, speak, and hear in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I pray that no person will leave the pl this place the same way that they came in, but that today is the start of something new. In the mighty and powerful name of Jesus, work in our hearts, God. Work in our hearts today. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 2020. Everyone's laughing because everybody's got different views on 2020. But what a year. What a year. You know, and given that I've not had the opportunity to speak to many of you individually, I think it's worth just mentioning we've had an intense year. You know, lots of highs, potentially lots of lows, but it's been an intense year. Uh, as many of you know, my wife and I, we live in the UK, and uh, similar to in South Africa, we also had many, many restrictions. We had lockdowns similar to what you've had. In fact, we've had two lockdowns, and we managed to escape off of the second one by coming to Cape Town, which has been amazing. But we had restrictions on movement. There were travel restrictions within the country as well as outside. So I think, generally speaking, we've had disruption to our lives. The, the, the way we lived in 2019, I mean, when you had Christmas, Christmas service last year in 2019, who could have anticipated what 2020 would look like? So it's been, it's been an interesting year. But despite what some may consider chaos in 2020, as an introduction to this message, there are two things that I have observed that I would like to highlight this morning. The first thing that I've observed is that many believers around the world did not retreat. But instead, they advanced and they moved forward. So what does retreat mean? To retreat means to move back or withdraw or isolate. So if you think about a battle, sometimes in a battle you have confidence and you progress and you advance. But other times when you feel like you are outnumbered by the opponent or the people on the other side of the battle, you retreat. And you strategize. But what we've seen in the body, many, many believers around the world, we've seen the body advance and move forward. And there are things that we are doing today that we would not have done a year ago. Think about live stream. Think about doing services online. Instead of going into a corner and saying, we don't know how to do this in this new world, instead we advanced and we were aggressive in doing so by making sure that we can still continue the preaching and the ministry of the Word of God. And so even if you think about your personal life, in 2020, what was the stance that you've taken? 
in 2020, when in 2019, when you stepped into 2020, there were many promises that you were given by the Lord. And I guess as we head to the end of 2020, and it's not over, we're going to finish strong, as Pastor Thurston said this morning. But think through the many promises that you were given in your life. And how did you respond when the world around you, when the external environment around you started changing? How did you respond to that? Did you retreat or did you move forward in the promise that God has given you? And so that's a reflection point that I would like us all to think about this morning. You know, and it's easy to say in a time like we are in, I will do so next year. Or I'll do so when there's more certainty. You know, and I've been so encouraged, one example, by this family. Today, you're all seated in a fantastic building. This is one example of advancing. This is an amazing example of advancing. Your pastors could have decided, I, I hear the Lord saying we need to do this. But why, do, why don't we wait for more certainty? Or why don't we wait till things calm down? Whatever that means in the current world. But instead, they decided we are going to move. And we're going to do so aggressively. And I must say, this is an amazing facility that you have. And everybody involved, I know a lot of the members have been involved over the last few months. So well done on advancing and doing so aggressively. So we trust God. You know, we are, as, a, as, a, as a church uh, back in London, we, at the beginning of the year, we were we had a sort of open service, if you can call it that, and we were just listening to God. We spent time just, you know, waiting, really. And uh, this was in the beginning of Jan, trusting God and to, to hear from Him in terms of what He wants us to do in 2020 and what the promises are that He's given to us as a, as a ministry, as a church. And uh, my wife will testify to this. I actually sent Pastor this in the video at the beginning of the year. We had... We were trusting God and people, we were coming forward and people were prophesying over what we're expecting God to do in 2020. And just before we packed up the service uh, on that specific day, we had an analog clock, you know, the, the clock, those analog clocks that, that go. And as we turned, we looked at this clock. And when we looked, the clock started speeding up as we were just sitting there looking. The clock started going faster and faster and faster. And the word God gave us was acceleration. This was a supernatural encounter and God speaking to us. Now, you can do one of two things in the current environment when you get a word like acceleration. Because actually, what has the world done this year to a large degree? We slowed down. We slowed down. And so, as a ministry, as a church, as a body, we were grappling with this because we were saying, Lord, you are telling us that we need to accelerate. But in the natural, it doesn't seem like we are accelerating because everything seems to be slowing down. But we stood on the promises of God and we said we are going to advance aggressively because God gave us the promise. And so therefore, we are going to move with that promise. We're not going to go back. Everything around us has told us, relax, calm down, stay on Zoom, don't tell anybody about the services. But instead, we, did, we advanced and we did so aggressively. So that's the first thing. The second thing I have observed and experienced, family of God, is that our Father, the one who loves us, is in control. God, God, God is in control. And His promises stand. God has never left us, and He will never leave us. He has not forsaken us, and He will never forsake us. He remains in control. You know, I think for many of us in the room, this pandemic that we are currently in is arguably one of the biggest or largest global world events that we are that we have experienced you know many of us weren't around in world war three let me just scan or world war two sorry let me just scan the room and make sure that uh, nobody was around i don't think so we weren't involved perhaps in other pandemics and so for us many of us this is a first you know and from this we have been strengthened to handle i think a lot more than we thought we are capable of because before 2020, you did not know that you'll be able to handle what you have been through in 2020. And I'm saying all of that to say that one, God is in control. And two, you have been strengthened. Physically, mentally, you are tougher than what you thought you were by the grace and the goodness of God. The scripture that I want to highlight this morning related to God being in control is Isaiah 41.10. The Bible says, so do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will upload, uphold you with my righteous right hand. And so, the way I approach life, I think, and you can ask my wife about this after the service, but generally, if I have questions about how to navigate something, I go to the Word. 
because I find my answer there. And so reading this scripture gives me so much comfort. And because I trust God and I've seen God do miracles over and over, year after year, for me, that settles it. I don't have to fear. I don't have to be dismayed. God is with me. He strengthens me, helps me. He upholds me with his righteous right hand. And so God is in control. I say all of that to emphasize, and I hope I'm making the point clear, that God has not left us. We're sitting in December. We can look back. Pastor Thurston spoke this morning about reflection. God has not left us. God is here. And it's important we remind ourselves of that because we might say it, but what I am addressing today is what do we do with our actions? Because it's one thing to say, God is with me, but how do you live? What do you do every single day? Do you live as if God is with you? Or are you just saying it? Mere talk leads to poverty. All hard work brings a profit. Again, talking about the, or distinguishing between talking and doing. And so with that in mind, I want to shift focus. That was just a very brief introduction. I want to shift focus from what God can do for us to what is required of us as the church. So on the one hand, we know God is in control. God has brought us through. God has provided. God has seen to us in 2020. Now let's shift focus because we understand that now. He spoke about we don't have to fear. We don't have to be dismayed. He holds us up with his righteous right hand. We don't need to be concerned because he's with us. But this question around what is required of us as the church has been a meditation point for me for many months in 2020 because I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, I know that you are with me. How would you have me respond in the environment that we are in right now? Jesus, what do you want me to do? Father, what do you want me to do? How should I respond? And although this question came up because of the times that we are in, it's not specific to the times that we are in. In general, more broadly, I'm asking, Lord, how would you have me respond in my life? What, would you, what, what is my role? What do you want your bride to do? How do you want your church to function? And what part can I play in that? You see, family, the times that we are in has a way of focusing us on our own needs. Think about it. The times that we are in has a way of focusing us on our own needs. We get consumed with my toilet paper. I don't know if you had the same problem, but we had a toilet paper supply chain issue in the UK. And I mean, even during a second lockdown, after people realized there was enough toilet paper in the country, still, we went into lockdown in November. We went to the shop the one day and there was no toilet paper. And I said, have people not learned that there's enough toilet paper in the United Kingdom? But we have a way of focusing on ourselves. It's, I need to preserve me and mine, and I lose focus of the world around me. And that's, to some degree, okay. We need to look after ourselves. But I think the conversation I'm trying to have with us all today is we need to get balance in how we think about what is required of us as the church. It's not just about me and mine, but we are part of a bigger story. You, as an individual, are part of this story. This story is part of a bigger Cape Town story. Cape Town story is part of a bigger South Africa, and South Africa part of the world. So there's a bigger picture than you and yours. And over several months and weeks, I spend time reading the word with this question. Jesus, what would you have me do? How should I respond? And the key scripture for today's message had, has brought clarity for me and what I would like to focus on. The key scripture for today's message is Mark 12, 28 to 31. Mark 12, 28 to 31. One of the teachers of the law, the Bible says, came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Wow. Now, we've, we've read that scripture. I know it. Uh, I, was, I was born in the Anglican church, and so I, this was something that we would say every Sunday. But I don't know if I 
in the context of where we are in the world right now, grasp how powerful those few verses are. And so based on this scripture, my conclusion to the question around how should we respond is the following. Love God, love people. Love God, love people. And you'll hear me saying that throughout today because I want it to be in our hearts. I want it to find the root in our hearts. Love God, love people. How do we respond? Love God and love people. And if we look at the scripture, there are a few things that, that stand out for me. Firstly, there are two focus areas. Love God and love people. Personally, my wife jokes about this with me, I am a fan of frameworks. I like to use a structure to think through problems, opportunities, challenges. I like structure in that way because it helps me to think through a specific issue and to a degree, in some way, ensures that I consider all, if not all, most areas. And so this scripture is very helpful for me because the fact that Jesus said or says the greatest commandment is to love God and to love people helps me because everything I do in my life, I can gauge against that framework. For example, when I lift my hands in worship, what is that? It's an act of love for God. When I cook a meal for somebody, or I give somebody a lift, that's an act of love for people. And so I can gauge everything that I'm doing. Does it meet the definition of either love God or love people? So it's very helpful for me. Because sometimes we are ask, we question ourselves. I'm sure you do too, if not just me. We ask, Lord, is what I'm doing in line with what you want me to do? Sometimes you get a word from God and maybe you are not entirely sure about what step to take. For me, this has helped me tremendously in 2020 because God has given me instruction on certain things to do. And what's great for me is that I can measure it against love God and love people. And in fact, I think that everything we do as believers can or should be related back to these two elements. In fact, the Bible says in Matthew 22 that all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So in our daily lives, ask yourself, is what I'm doing in line with, does it meet, I don't want to say the definition, but does it meet the, the commandment that Jesus is giving us, love God, love people. Secondly, the words with all are repeated with each noun. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. I love that. I love that. And I think the reason why that's being done is to place emphasis on, or equal emphasis, let me say, on each area that God wants us to love him with. One is not more important than the other. There is equal emphasis on all of them, and so all of them get a with all attached to it. Because God wants us to love in all of those areas and with the same degree. The word all speaks of holistic. It speaks of whole. It speaks of entire or, or complete. So there's a completeness point to it. The Bible does not say love God with part of or most of. It says with all of. And this is challenging. I'm not standing here today telling you this is easy, but it's a good challenge. How many of you like to be challenged? I love to be challenged. Because just when you think you've got it, then you get a nice kick. And you're like, no, you don't have it yet. Get challenged. And so I love it when God's word challenges me. And so this point of all stresses the fact that there can be no holding back or incompleteness in our devotion and our commitment to God. No holding back. No holding back. Thirdly, the scripture speaks about loving God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now, I'm not going to go into each of these areas individually because it will take us quite a bit of time. But I think the overarching message from emphasizing all of these areas is that our love for God should encompass all of our being in every area of our lives. So it's one thing to say we're going to give God all of our mind, all of our soul, but are you giving God all of your strength? It's perhaps speaking of being something in the physical. What are we giving to God? And so your entire being, all of who we are, God says, 
love me with that. Not only specific areas, but love me with all of who you are. And then fourthly, loving your neighbor comes naturally if you love God. Jesus said, and the second is like it. In other words, there's a relationship between loving God and loving people. These two events or these two commandments or these areas that Jesus gives, they're not mutually exclusive. They are related. They are related. So we can say, God, I love you. But, we don't, but I don't love that person. The second is like it. There's a relationship, a positive correlation between loving God and loving people. In fact, 1 John 4, 20, the Bible says, if you were doubting what I was saying, whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Can we do verse 21? Can I just see what's there? And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and their sister. And so the interesting thing about the scripture is that it's making a distinction between hate and love. And so if we, for me, it helps me to visualize. If we have hate on the one side and we have love on the other side, the scripture is not saying operate somewhere in the middle. Come on. Some of you are saying, can't we go a little bit more to, can't we go a little bit more to the hate side? Isn't that allowed? Isn't that okay? Doesn't God bless us when we do? No. But it's not talking about tolerating your neighbor. How many of us do that? We tolerate people. And I also get frustrated just like you. But the challenge, and again, everyone said earlier they love challenges. So the challenge to all of us is we need to move to this side of the spectrum. More and more. And sometimes you might go, but just keep pushing back. When your mind tells you, this person has wronged me, keep pushing back. Keep moving to love. So we're not required to operate in the center, which I think sometimes we love our lives in that space. I know, Lord, you say I must love people, but it's getting really hard. And we're going to talk in a moment about some practical ways that you can love God and love people. But I want us to be very clear. We are not talking about tolerating people. We're definitely talking about hate because the scripture is clear. But we're not talking about tolerance. We're talking about extreme love for God and for people. And you know what? Jesus actually takes it further in John 13. And he says, a new commandment I give to you. That you love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. Friends, the challenge continues. Just when you thought, okay. Now the commandment is, Jesus says, love like I have loved you. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how we get to that pure, perfect God love. But I will spend all of my days on the earth trying to get there. And as, as I said earlier, challenge accepted. Challenge accepted. Thank you, Jesus, for challenging us. And so the new commandment is love like Jesus loves. And my prayer today is that God will help us to see people through his eyes and through his perspective. Did you know that if you look through the eyes of God, which is not the easiest thing to do, but if you go around, if you leave this place and you go to checkers and you observe people, not through your mind and your vision, but you just have God's perspective, people change in front of you. The way they look changes. And I don't mean in the physical sense, I mean the value of the human changes. You see them as just, for example, somebody working in the aisles at Checkers. God sees them very differently. And if we get his perspective, it's going to influence how we are able to love people. And we need that perspective. And so today, if you will allow me, Lord, brainwash us. Lord, change our thinking, change our mindset, change the way we see other people. And let us love and let us do so intentionally. Love is not, loving people is not an accident or something that you just come across. 
If you think about love and you think about how Jesus loved, there was intent behind how he loved. He had an opportunity to turn away and say, I don't want to go through with this. But he made a decision. And so today I want us to make a decision. That we're going to love people like Jesus loves us. And so the next question is, how do we practically love God and people? And I like practicality. Because although we accept the challenge, how do we do this when we leave this building? And there are so many ways that we can do this. We can spend a lot of time today talking about it. And I'm sure you've got your own thoughts, which is great. But I thought I'll just quickly highlight two areas under each of love God and love people that I think we can walk away with today. And I believe God wants to speak to us. Firstly, loving God requires obedience. In John 14, Jesus says, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. And I love what Pastor Thurston talked about this morning because this point around talking and not doing is a big point. Obedience is not about saying yes. That is not obedience. Because if you don't do anything, if there's inaction, you are not being obedient. So when God gives us instruction, it's one thing to say amen. It's one thing to say yes. But how do you actually, or do you actually go and do what you've been instructed to do? We sing, choose me, which is great. And I say it today, Lord, choose me. But there's a responsibility that comes with it and there's action that comes with God choosing and selecting you to go and do what it is that he's called you to do. So obedience is more than just talking. Obedience is action. Obedience is doing something. And you know what, family? If we take a step back and we think about why we are meeting today, let's just take a moment and think about why. What are we, and this is, this is, this is my own personal time with God. I like to ask, why am I doing the things that I'm doing? Because if I don't get and understand why, I need to change it. Why I need to get the answers to it. Part of why we meet today is we get encouraged, which is amazing. Part of why we meet today is we come together and we worship God collectively, which is what the Bible instructs. Do not neglect the gathering of the saints. This is all part of what we're doing. But also part of why we are here today is to be equipped for what we need to do out there. We must remember that. And again, I'm shifting focus from me and mine to what is required of us. We are being equipped for the work of ministry. God is equipping us. When you come here Sunday after Sunday, the word you get taught is to equip you to take action out there. If all we are doing is coming here to have a good service, we need to think about that again. We need to think about our impact out there. And this is not this is not a question for the boundless. This is a question for me as an individual. What is my impact out there? This year I had so many opportunities to, in a one-on-one -on -one capacity, just talk to people about God. Never before have I had so many opportunities, just calmly, having breakfast with a friend. And, and the friend asks, so you believe in Jesus? I say, yes. Tell me more. I've never had so many open doors to minister to people. And, and I'm not talking about public corporate settings. I'm talking about one-on-one -on -one individual settings. And so, remember that we are being equipped for what we need to do out there. It's very important. And there's nothing wrong with everything else that I've also mentioned. But part of, I'm just trying to bring a little bit of balance in our thinking around why we do what we do. Secondly, loving God requires us to know Him. Wow. Wow. We need to know the Father. You know, related to the scripture we've just read, in order to obey Him, we need to know Him. And a question I continuously ask myself, and maybe you've heard this before, just to challenge my own thinking, and this is a reflection point for me on a regular basis, how much of what I know about God is my personal revelation versus how much I know about God based on what I hear other people say? So the, 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 the things you are quoting, the things that you are saying, the things that you believe in, is that personal to you? Or are you repeating what somebody else has told you and you've made a mental note and it feels like the right thing to say? So, knowing God is not hearsay or secondhand. It's personal to you as an individual. And so ask yourself that question. How much 
of what I say and what I know about God is based on what I hear others saying compared to how much I know based on what God is speaking to me. And how do we do this? How do we know God? Time. Time with the Lord is how we know Him. Many of you have relationships with one another in a friendship setting, or maybe you're in a relationship, maybe you're married. How do you get to know your partner? You spend time with them. Quality time. So with God, spending time with Him in prayer, spending time in His Word is so vital for us as believers. And knowing Him will empower us to be obedient, which is what the Bible speaks when He says, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. Loving people, how do we do this? Firstly, I have to say, we've got to reach people for Jesus. We've got to. The best way that we can share or we can love on people is to share the gospel. And I like to, based on my framework way of thinking, I think about this segmented in two ways. I think, when I think about loving people, I think about spiritual Eternal is the spiritual. Reaching people for Jesus. Eternal consequences. And I, I, I'm pausing here intentionally and repeating myself because I want this thing to head home. I think sometimes we live life as if we think we're going to live forever. And this is by no means a negative thing. I'm not trying to be negative or I'm still a very positive person, but I think we need to think about how we live our lives in our personal capacity, but also how we engage with others and what we say to other people. Because I think that if we, for me, 2020, with this pandemic also, I, I think I got to a place where I realized we don't live forever. <laughs> it was a, it was a, I guess I knew it in my mind, but the reality of it is big. People that I know who passed on, the reality of this is huge. And so what it does do is it creates a sense of urgency in how we live. It creates a sense of urgency because you don't have this perspective of I'm going to be 150 years old. And so I've got another, for me, 120 years to make a difference or to speak to people about Jesus or to reach people for Jesus. So there's a sense of urgency, and this is not a pressurized sense, but I think sometimes when we talk about reaching people for Jesus, we make, it a, we make it a song and dance. We make it, there must be lights, there must be a congregation. It's, not, it's very simple, actually. Wow. And I say that because in 2020 I experienced it. I experienced how easy it is to share. You can be calmly sitting with somebody. The conversation, you could direct it in that way. God will direct it in that way. But if you are not aware or you're not intentional, you miss those moments. I think that if you go sit down and you think about all the potential moments you had in 2020, you might realize, wow, actually, you know what? I've had a few opportunities. I wasn't really aware of it. I didn't think about it in that way. I wasn't maybe intentional, but God has opened up those doors. And so it's a very simple thing, speaking to somebody about the one you love. And that's our part that we need to play. When I ask the Lord, Lord, what is required of me? What is required of us as the church? That is our part to play. Share the gospel. Speak to people about Jesus. And it's very quiet in here, but I think that's okay. I'm comfortable. I'm very comfortable. Maybe we get excited in a moment. But I'm very comfortable in this space. Because I feel God is speaking this to us. Family of God. Let's have a little bit of urgency. And I'm not saying, I'm not really expecting you to run around when you leave here, go to checkers and ask for the microphone for the old shop. That's not what I'm expecting. Well, that's not what I don't think the Lord is necessarily expecting. But you have people in your world that you can reach, people you work with. I will never meet them. Your pastors will never meet them. You have people in your world that you can reach and make a difference in their lives. So do that. But live with intent. Look for those opportunities. And you know what? When you start looking, you find they are there. You know? If you think about from a business perspective, if you aren't looking, you're not going to find. You're not going to find. 
If you're looking for an opportunity, you're looking for a connection, you're looking for a partner, only when you do that intentionally do you actually find that. It's, this is how it works. If you're living your life, you're just walking, you don't look around, you're just in your own space, doing your own thing. You don't observe the many opportunities that come your way. You need to look. <laughs> look. <laughs> your waitress, when you have lunch this afternoon at Tiger's Milk, is that a good place? Is that good? Okay, it's been a while for me, so I don't know. I would have said wimpy, but anyway. Um, your waitress is going to come to you and they're going to say, think. Is there maybe an opportunity? Like, it's just casual. And you don't have to, when they come and bring your food, don't lay your hands on them. They are working. <laughs> but you can engage in a casual conversation. It's, it's very, I don't know. I'm starting to feel like we must live naturally like that. Just natural. Just normal. You know, just be. Just When you see an opportunity, go. Don't make it a big thing. Someone can say the prayer and they can still keep their eyes open. They can pray the prayer of salvation by keeping their eyes open. The waitress can be there and while she's collecting a tip from you, she can say, Lord, I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. I commit my life to you. We don't need, you don't need to call Pastor Thurston. It won't be later to come and do the prayer of salvation. Please don't do that. You will not be happy with me. So reach people for Jesus, family. What we are doing here today is bigger than us. It's bigger. It's bigger. There's a big picture. And again, the Lord's perspective on all of this is, is big. And I'm not talking about the mountain. I'm talking about the world, the church globally. God's perspective sometimes looks different to ours. And we must just realign our thinking and our mindset with that perspective. So that we can live effective lives for Him. And ultimately, that's what we want, Right? We want to love God. We want to love people the way he is asking of us to love God and love people. So that's the first part, dealing with spiritual consequences. And, I, and I, I've, I've spent a bit of time there because it's so vital. And I really feel the Lord speaking that and saying, look around. Don't do this. Look up. Look to the right. Look to the left. And you'll see all of those opportunities. Secondly, live generously is how we love people. Live generously. Living generously requires giving of yourself. Now, when you heard me say generous, you thought financial. I mean, I think it's normal. We, we, that's how we think. But giving of yourself is financial, absolutely one part of it. But it's more than that. It's giving of your time. Giving of your resources. Giving of yourself. Doing a favor for another person. Helping people out. Sharing your toilet paper. Giving of yourself. And I know for some of you, you still like, no one's laughing for that uh, toilet paper thing because it's like, I'm keeping my toilet paper. I am not giving that to anybody. And you know what? There is absolutely a positive correlation between love and giving. We know the scripture, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Giving is an extension of love. When you give, when I give something to my wife, as an example, I'm doing so because I'm doing it out of love. I can't say to her, and her love language is gifts, I can't say to her that I love you, but I'm not going to give you any of my time, of my resource, of anything. I can't do that. Giving is a natural extension of that. And you know, I really want to also emphasize this because, as I mentioned earlier, a pandemic like the one we're in is a way of us focusing on our own needs. We are so... Oh, I was shocked this year when, when I just monitored the behavior of people. I mean, one night we went to go and buy groceries. It was like, it was fairly late, 7 p.m. Uh, just when lockdown started or it was coming, the people were aware that something is coming and we found nothing. We couldn't find food in the shop. We went to only one of the stores, but I was a bit shocked. I must be honest. I thought, why would we store up ourselves as people, knowing that there are other people who are also going to need. And at no point did the government in the UK at least say that we're going to have supply chain issues with food, there's not enough produce, so therefore we can't make all of the foods that we need. I think there was a fairly good understanding amongst everybody that we would be okay. But still, 
the mind and the behavior of people. I think what a crisis sometimes does is it exposes who you are. I think that's what happens. And so we were quite shocked. I mean, I don't know, what did we end up eating that night? It must have, I don't know. We put something together so we weren't starving. But 100% not the ideal choice of meal, I don't think. Uh, but I want to emphasize this because when you, when you, whether you realize it or not, sometimes you subconsciously close your hand. You don't even know. And again, I like living intention. I like thinking about what I'm doing. And I like reflecting. So sometimes you don't even know that you are doing this. You don't look like you're doing this, but you are doing it in your heart. You're doing this. You don't open. You, you keep it closed. Because there's pressure on you in some way to focus on your own needs and make sure that you are okay. And part of me, I want to bring a balance to this because part of me says, I think in some instances, perhaps that's a very normal reaction. You know, you, you self-preservation, when they study humanity, they say self-preservation is the thing that humans do. We will look after ourselves, you know, and sometimes we will look after ourselves to the detriment of other people. This is what they say about humans. Not, not, this is not the Bible. This is not the Lord. This is just what people say about how they've studied humans. But God is asking us to oppose that type of thinking. He's saying, don't do that. Don't only look at yourself. Whatever they've told you about how humans preserve themselves or how they focus on self-preservation, don't do that. Look around you at your neighbor and see whether you can, instead of doing this, do this. Not only when you are asked, but look. I think if you look, you'll find that there are people who are close to you that are in need. And you have the ability to help. So instead of doing this, do this, but do so intentionally. And don't wait for somebody to say, do you have? Loving generously is, the way I like to think about it, it's an overflow of who I am. So I'm not only going to respond when people say I need, but I'm going to be generous, just in wherever I can, whatever I can do. So live generously. So, in conclusion, the key question we started off today with was, what does Jesus want me to do? What is required of me? How do I respond in a time like this? But also, I think some of these things we can apply more broadly. Once this pandemic is over, we can keep this. My response to the key question of this message, which was, how do I respond, is love God and love people. Love God, love people. As you do your daily business, think about whether what you are doing is it reflecting a love for God? Is it reflecting a love for people? And look for opportunities to do that. More practically, we said that the way we love God is by knowing and obeying Him. Knowing Him by spending time with Him in prayer and in the Word and obeying, which involves doing. Not just yes and amen and not doing anything. Not in action, but taking action. And then secondly, we love people by sharing Jesus with them. And living generously. Could I ask someone to come and play on the keyboard? Or that will be fantastic. And I want us to pause here so that this message can, can find root in our hearts. And I think the world needs this also. Very much what we have done today is we are, we are literally changing the way we think in, and taking the focus off of us. And I'm saying let's look and see what's going on in the world. There's a lot of need, material needs, spiritual needs. And I can tell you right now, we always talk about this, my wife and I, we say, especially in a UK context, they, sometimes they think that they are better. <laughs> they're not better. But sometimes they think they're better. And, 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 but what we are starting to see a lot, even with our friendship circle, maybe you are not believers, is that people are searching. People are searching. People are doing meditation and again there's nothing wrong with this I'm just I'm just saying people are searching for something more than what they see because actually what COVID does is or what this year has done is it's exposed the fact that even for people not who are not believers is that life is not forever and so there's a there's a sense I feel of surely there must be more and the amazing thing is that we have the answers. 
We have the answers. The thing that your friend, colleague, neighbor, uncle is looking for, you have the answers within you. So the question is, what are you going to do? Because if we have the answers, unfortunately, ignorance is not bliss anymore. Having answers means you have responsibility. And I, I hope no one has regretted coming to the service because now you have, to a degree, some responsibility. Not in a pressured way at all. I have a responsibility as I prepare this message to do what I'm talking about today. So, could I ask the worship team to come up as well, if you don't mind? I just want us to think through this as we worship. And we can just sing any worship song. And we can love on God in the form of worship today. Because he says, love God and love people. So we've talked a lot about loving people. But we realize that Loving people is an extension of loving God. It starts there. I think it's very hard to love people if you don't love God. And so I want us to take a few moments. Would you stand with me if you don't mind? And I want us just to take a moment and love on Him. Show Him, Lord, I love you. We've established at the beginning of the service that God is in control. He's not left us. He's not forsaken us. I'm so thankful today that God is, God is who He is. That He remains faithful despite what's going on in the world. I was thinking as I was preparing this this week, I was thinking, you know, <laughs> when the pandemic struck, there was no board meeting in heaven where God called everyone and said, guys, we have an unexpected occurrence that has occurred on the earth. You know, like sometimes our companies respond to, to external situations. Like, okay, every single company that's around today had a meeting about COVID-19. Do you know that? Every company said, we need to strategize because we were not expecting this. So we need to now formulate a plan to deal with this. Not for God. The plan was there thousands and thousands of years ago. The plan was there before you were born. There was knowledge that you would go through this. Your families would go through this. And God was like, if we read in 2019 that God is faithful, nothing changed in 2020. Nothing's going to change in 20. When things are good next year, you're not going to say, wow, God is faithful. Nothing changes. Nothing. He's exactly the same. Yesterday, today, and forever more. We quote that. Do we believe it? Like, honestly, like, really, like, like, and this, you answer this for yourself. To your core, do you believe that? Because we can't say He's faithful when things are going well only. In the midst of sometimes very challenging times, reflect on how faithful he is. I'm sure many of you have testimonies here today of how God has brought you through this year. God has brought you through other years. Sometimes we approach situations as if it's the first time that we are going through it. But if you just take a moment, you realize, wow, Lord, you've done this many times before. I don't need to worry because I've seen your provision too many times to wonder whether you are now going to do it again. And you will. God will do it again. Every single one of us is a testimony of the goodness of God. Standing here today, you might not think it, you might not feel it, but you are a testimony of the goodness of God. So next week, you might face a challenging situation. Remember, He's faithful. He's good. He's in control. The same way you're about to worship Him now, do that next week in the midst of your difficult situation. So can we sing a song? I'm not sure exactly what King is playing, but perfect. Come on, that's good. Let's lift our hands as an act of surrender, an act of honor. Yes. all things new all things
spoken into our hearts today Lord it's challenging we don't discount that but it's your word and so what more is there to be said today we're not trying to defend your word Lord we're not trying to find holes or poke holes. we just take it for what it is and if you say we need to love you and love people that is what we are going to do today we have received an answer and so therefore we know we have responsibility, God, to do what you have instructed us to do. And so it's the festive season, God. It's a time where people wind down, but I believe that our level of alertness spiritually will go up. As Pastor Thurston said earlier, Lord, at the boundless, there's no slowing down this festive season. We are progressing and we are advancing aggressively. And so we thank you, Lord God, for the fact that we are going to make a difference this December. In our personal lives, and not only December, but for the years, the years, the years, the years, the years to come. Father, we are thankful today. Thankful that you've carried us in 2020. We are standing here strong, healthy. Thank you for the healing power that is available here. So if anybody's not well in their bodies, I speak healing over your body today. I command every sickness and disease to go. In the name of Jesus, I speak into that ailment. I speak into that sickness. And I declare that you are whole, you are well, you are healthy. I thank you, Lord, that mentally we are healthy. If you don't feel well mentally I speak into that today and I declare that you are mentally whole you are mentally healthy every spirit of depression anxiety it goes now in the name of Jesus I speak into that by the authority given to me through Jesus I speak into that and I declare it shall no longer affect you today is a day of breakthrough Today is a day of deliverance. Today is a day of freedom. Right now, your mind is being renewed. It's being renewed. It's being changed. Thank you, Father. Thank you that you brainwash us with your mind, God. Because your mind has no depression. Your mind has no mental health. Your mind has no issues. Clear. Perfect. We receive that today. Come on. We receive the mind of the Father. Yeah, that's good. We receive the mind of the Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And so, Father, we love you so, so much. Wow. Where would we be without you? What would we do without the amazing, never-ending grace of God? And if ever you've doubted God's grace, 2020, if you reflect, you'll realize that God's grace is plentiful. It's never ending. His mercy is truly on you every morning. Wow. Every day you can make a fresh start because of that new mercy. 
He is so good. And I hope that today, what I really wanted to empower you with is to say that God is in control firstly. As a foundation, God is in control. Don't worry. Don't worry. Do what you need to do. Listen to what He's saying. Do that. And from there, you will take care of the rest. And our response, now that we've settled the fact that He's looking after us, is let's go out and make a difference. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Thurston. Amen. Can you give God the praise? And let's honor um, Aldrin for that amazing message. You can do a little better than that. That was a strong, rich message. If you receive, if you can walk, if you sing, I'm walking away with a new mind, a new heart, just give the Lord a praise in the house. Amen. It's making all things new. Wow, powerful. Thank you so much, Aldrin. Thank you so much for that strong, rich message. And I was definitely challenged. Um, challenged in my heart. Um, there was one, of, there was definitely two keys that that made me reflect on a personal level and um, and so I think this 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 message has has us provo has provoked us to action there's there's areas in your life today that you can look at leave this place and say this is where I want to obey and this is where I want to get practical this is where I want to be generous and so I'm thankful I heard the voice of God this morning and I know that the Lord has spoken very clearly and I know to many of you you've heard God speak in your hearts he's led you and he's opened up truth to you and things that you need to do so obey God and and it's just just watch him watch him unfold and watch him perform and do his word amen wow thank you so much thank you so much it's always a temptation when you're done you know to say but everything's been said already everything has been you know it was awesome i could just feel how the anointing wasn't on me <laughs> when i was worshiping i was like lord where are you you know the lord said i've anointed my servant <laughs> you relax I've been so accustomed, you know. And God said, I've anointed him this morning to speak. And this, I fill this mouth with life. Amen. To declare what I want him to declare this morning. And so, for the very last time, can we honor Aldrin and Merlin this morning and just thank God for their lives. And Amen. Well, church, it's going to be an incredible December. We, I think we've...